I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to this new message in a brand new series. And this series is called The Morning After. We're going to be talking about one of the most unique times and one of the most crucial times in the history of the world, in the history of, of God's interaction with mankind. One of the most important things that's ever going to happen. And it's going to be the most phenomenal blessing to the bride of Christ, but it's going to be an incredible curse to the world. You know, when I think about blessings and cursing, my mind just runs to all kinds of examples. And in my audio series, I'll be sharing a lot more of these examples, but I only have a certain amount of time here in this video series. But, uh, you know, I think about uh, the Charles Dickens book, A Tale of Two Cities. And of course, almost everybody has either read that book, had to read it in school, or at least have heard it quoted so many times. Uh, the opening line of that book says, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Man, what an opening for a book. No wonder it's a classic uh, that for decades people have read uh, when they're going through school to understand great literature. Now, what does it mean, best of times, the worst of times? Well, this was speaking of a time when there were radical opposites occurring uh, at the same place and the same time. Uh, and you know, it, th this happens so much, we don't really tend to recognize it. Usually, if we're going through really, really, really bad times, we don't get to lift our head up from, you know, from the grinding wheel to even figure out what's happening for people that is going great for. You know, an interesting thing, by the way, is, uh, is one of the reasons that the elite in this world, the wicked of this world, one of the reasons they create crisis, financial crisis, uh, every, uh, every few decades is so that there can be a transfer of wealth. Because more millionaires are made in bad times than are made in good times. Because in bad times, the poor people and the middle class people that have to actually work for a living they end up losing their property, losing their homes, losing their businesses, having to sell them for pennies on the dollar to the wicked. And there's always this great transfer of wealth from the poor, the hardworking, to the wicked, to the corrupt, to the elite. And so, but we don't really recognize that most of the time because we, we just got our head down trying to make a buck, trying to, trying to feed our families, trying, trying to work hard and, 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 be, and be responsible. But so many times in planet Earth, the worst and the best will be happening in any particular country at any given time at the very same moment. Well, I got news for you. Uh, the best and the worst of times is coming to the world, but it is beyond anything that the world has ever, ever experienced. And, you know, there is this sense uh, in, in the world right now that the worst of times is coming. Now, there, there are people who don't understand what's going on. They buy into the elitist narrative. They are convinced that somehow or another, the government is going to save us from the crises that are occurring uh, uh, all over the world, uh, not really realizing that it is the very people who are promising to save us who are creating the crisis, because by creating a crisis, this transfer of wealth will happen once again, where the, the hardworking, honest people uh, in the middle and lower class will lose what they have spent their lives working for, and the wealthy will, will once again uh, take control of the wealth of the earth. Now, uh, I know that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. And, but also know that uh, the way the final transfer is going to come from the wealth of the wicked is not going to be natural. It's not going to be something that, that we go out and figure out how to do or that we, that we pray into existence or that sort of thing. It's going to be something that happens because God moves in the world in a way that uh, we've only barely seen little smatterings, if you will of anything as phenomenal as what God is going to do. You know, the Bible speaks of a time, and the word that we use to describe this time is called rapture. 
Now, the word rapture, many people argue, is not even in the Bible. Well, it's not. The word rapture is a transliteration from a Latin word in, in the Latin Bible. But the word that uh, from, from which we get uh, the Latin word that sounds like rapture is a Greek word called harpazo. And the harpazo is a time that the Bible speaks of a great catching away, a calling away, if you will, of the bride of Christ to meet with our Lord and Savior for the most unique event in all of history. Now, let me tell you, this is so important that you know about what we call the rapture. And I'm going to refer to it as the rapture because that's what, that's what most people understand it to be. But uh, so important because I'm telling you, a life on planet Earth is going to get so bad in the upcoming years that those who are not looking for and expecting uh, God to take us away from all of this, uh, they, they won't survive. They, they will not have the hope. They will not have the confidence. They will not have the peace that, that will make it, them able to endure what's happening on planet Earth. Now, let me just say this. There are many, many people who believe in a doctrine that says, you know, the church is going to rise up and the church is going to take over the world. We're going to establish righteousness in the world. And we're going to, and when we do that, we're going to turn it over to Jesus. Well, let, let me say something. First of all, uh, that has been tried before and it's called Catholicism. Now, I'm not trying to bash Catholics here, but I'm just saying that was the real goal of the Catholic church, a universal church that was that was politically driven with the intention of taking over uh, the kingdoms of the world and wicked men getting the wealth and the control of the world and oppressing the poor. That, that's, that's what it was all about. And so uh, there's nowhere in the Bible that, that presents the idea that the church is actually going to be the one to rise up and overthrow uh, what the wicked one is doing in planet earth and what wicked people are doing in planet earth. We'll, we'll go into this in, in future in future messages about this. But the main thing that I want you to understand is this. In this series, I am going to be doing everything I can to prepare you to have a heart full of hope. You know, the word hope literally means a confident expectation of good things. And if we actually have the hope of God, you know, God is a God of hope. God always wants us to have an expectation of good things. He always wants us to face whatever challenges we're going to be facing uh, with an expectation that he is our God and that, that he is absolutely going, going to deliver us. And the apostle Peter said that if we have hope in us, that people are going to want to know, what is this hope that you have in you? In other words, why are you, why do you have peace? Why do you have confidence when everybody else is panicked, when everybody else uh, is, is really falling apart around the world? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Almost everyone who believes in prophetic gifts uh, recognize that it has been prophesied time and time again that there will be a great end time revival. And you know something? I believe there is going to be, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the same thing that Smith Wigglesworth uh, said and that many other people have said, this great end time revival is really not going to happen inside the Orthodox Church because the Orthodox Church is what got us in the trouble that we're in. It didn't lead. It didn't, it didn't uh, become the, the pioneer of the world. It didn't deliver God's message to the world. It didn't fulfill our destiny in the world. And so, and so, but the church, what I consider to be the bride of Christ, that part of the church is in love with Jesus. That part of the church is looking for Jesus to come back and to take us away. That part of the church that has this great, what the apostle Paul called the blessed hope. That part of the church uh, is going to uh, represents such hope in dark times that the, that the whole world that hasn't fallen under the spell of the wicked one, the whole world is going to want to know, why do you have hope? Why do you have a confident expectation? And I'm telling you something, it, it's not going to happen through, uh, I, I, I'm sure there will be revival meetings, but the truth is, 
It's not going to happen through revival meetings. It's going to happen through believers who are filled with hope. They're going to they're going to uh, turn to God in, in massive, massive numbers, and they're going to uh, uh, they're going to uh, take this their hope to the world. So I want you to have hope in these hard times. I want you to be to know what's coming. I want you to have peace. I want you to have a confident expectation of what's coming. And and not it's not just for you. Praise God that you're going to be able to walk through in times of incredible darkness and have incredible expectation of good things, but also for the sake of those who have no hope right now. You know, there's going to be a great falling away. Man, can you imagine a time when suddenly, you know, the the, the hanger owners in the church, the people who really I go to church more for social reasons than they do for spiritual reasons. They're going to fall away. Uh, people who are not intimately connected with God, people who do not know God deeply and personally, they are going to fall away from God. They are going to turn to, to the wicked ones, the elite of the world, and to say, You're, you be our Savior. Uh, you know, we, we don't trust God anymore. We don't trust Jesus anymore. And there's going to be this incredible falling away. And I'm telling you what, there's a lot of people that we love that are going to be a part of that. But those of us who are supercharged with hope, we're going to be able to rescue some of those people before they go over the edge. But besides that, we are going to be able to reach people who have never surrendered their life to Jesus. And, and we're probably going to participate in one of the greatest uh, uh, move of miracles and the supernatural that the world has ever, ever seen. Now, what's really interesting about this, in the book of Exodus, and by the way, there are types of, uh, of the rapture uh, in the Bible, in several, several places. Now, you, the, the, uh, uh, the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt, making the journey to the promised land, was absolutely one of the clearest types of the body of Christ and what the body of Christ is supposed to, is supposed to do uh, we are we are supposed to come out of the world. We are supposed to become one with God, which was, which was a type that happened through the crossing of the Red Sea, getting baptized into the body of Christ, and then we were to connect with God so that all of God's word could be written on our heart, which is a type of what happened at Mount Sinai. Then we were supposed to make a short journey, not a forty-year journey like the children of Israel. We were supposed to make a short eleven-day journey where we went from being born again and experiencing Jesus in our hearts to enter into what the Jesus called the kingdom of heaven, because crossing the Jordan River uh, was not a type of going to heaven after you die. It was a, a type of connecting to the resources of God here in planet Earth, here in this earth. We were supposed to do that. that, that that's, that's the type of what was supposed to happen. But there, there are other types embedded in this journey of the children of Israel. And I want you to realize this. When, when God uh, sent Moses to go to Egypt, to Pharaoh, and to call Israel out of the world, he went and Moses carried this message. And in Exodus 4, 21, it says, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, and the, the, the God had met with Moses at the burning bush, if you'll remember. He said, when you go back to Egypt, see to it that you do all of these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. And I tell you, I look at the wonders that Pharaoh, I mean, that, that Moses did, and I see that as a type of miraculous things that God is going to do at the hands of believers uh, whenever, before he calls us out of the world, just like he called Israel out of Egypt. And so he says, so when you go back to Egypt, see to it that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, uh, but I will harden his heart so he will not let the people go. Now, I want you to understand something. There are phrases like this in the English language that do not clearly uh, depict what really happened. We read a phrase like God hardening someone's heart and say, see, God, and some people that God sovereignly chose to harden Pharaoh's heart, so he'd turn his heart against God, turn his heart against Israel. 
Well, that's really not exactly what happened because the message that God gave could produce incredible rejoicing, incredible celebration in your heart if, in fact, you love God, if you want it to go out and connect with God, if you want it to go out and spend time with God, man, you, you would rejoice at that message. But if you had some wicked ulterior motive, remember, the children of Israel were slaves to the Egyptians. Having slaves was a great source of wealth to the nation of Egypt. And so the Egyptians were more concerned about losing this wealth that came to them from these slaves. And so, so Pharaoh was more concerned about the economy. He was more concerned about the wealth of Egypt than he was about, yay, I'm going to get to see God do something incredible. I'm going to, I'm going to get to connect with the creator of the universe. Now, we do need to realize that during this process, Pharaoh came to at least intellectually acknowledge that God was God. And really, all these supernatural things that, that God did at the hands of, of Pharaoh, you know, where the water turned into blood, where there was a plague of frogs or a plague of fr flies and all these kind of things, every one of those curses were actually judgments against the gods that the people of Egypt worshipped. And so through every one of these events, uh, uh, it came, became clear to the people of Egypt that their gods were nothing. Oh, God, news for it. That's what's going to happen when the, when the Antichrist rises up and starts tormenting the world. Really, not even before then. When the elite, when those who hate God, when those who intend to eradicate all knowledge of God from the earth, when they begin to do this, God, at the hands of his servant, servants, are going is going to manifest the miraculous life and power of God in a way that says, these things that you worship, these things that you trust in, they are nothing, and really going to give people an opportunity to turn their hearts to Jesus, the one and only true Messiah. So in verse 22 of, of Exodus 4, he says, so then you shall say, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn, so I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me or worship me. And that's, that's basically what that word is referring to. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So God said, here's the deal. I want you to let my people go and to meet me out in the wilderness. Well, what we call the rapture is going to occur at a time when Jesus is calling his bride to leave this world, this, this Egypt, if you will, and meet him outside, you know, outside of Egypt and really worship him, serve him, rejoice with him. That's what that's going to be all about. And again, if, listen, if you want more details about this, if you want to understand more of what's going to happen during that period of time, I, I'm going to encourage you not only to listen to this free video series for the next several weeks, but also I want to encourage you to purchase the downloadable audio series of this because, you know, I'm, I'm going to go into hours and hours and hours of details for people who really want to establish the heart, get their, their heart fixed in hope. I'm going to give you everything I can, this free thing, but for those of you who want to go deeper, a couple of things happen. Number one, you invest in yourself. You get to take yourself to somewhere in your faith that otherwise you will probably never get the opportunity to go. Uh, but also, when you purchase uh, these audio series, uh, this gives us the finances to keep taking this message of the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth, which is the message that Jesus said needs to be taken to the end of the earth before the end can come. And so when you invest in yourself, you also create the finances to help us in, invest in others around the world. So, so God, it wasn't, God didn't harden Pharaoh's heart as a part of some kind of judgment against him. Actually, this really, really, really good word that God offered to the children of Israel, the honest truth is 
any of the Egyptians that wanted to repent of the of the pagan gods that they worshiped and go with the children of Israel, the real truth is they could have. They could have left Egypt with, uh, with Moses. Not only that, they could have escaped the curse that was coming on Egypt or primarily on the gods that the Egyptians worshiped. And, uh, and so, you know, we are going to have the opportunity to help people escape what's going to be coming on the world. Now, the tribulation, and you, you've heard that terminology, the tribulation is actually a seven-year period of time. And it's prophesied very clearly in the book of Daniel, is 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 thoroughly discussed in the book of Revelation. But the tribulation, the first three as a seven-year period, period of time, and the tribulation, the first three and a half years is the tribulation of the Antichrist. The last three and a half years is the wrath of God being poured out on the Antichrist and his followers. And I'm telling you, if the wicked hear these kinds of messages, they just laugh, they, they scorn, they ridicule God because, because they actually, they're actually trying to declare war on God. According to the scripture, there will be a declaration of war made against God. And we're going to go into that in this series. We're going to talk, we're going to talk about how the return of the Nephilim are going to play a major role in the, in the earth being seduced and thinking that they can go to war against God and possibly win. And I'm telling you, that, that's mind-blowing in itself. That's actually what happened just before the flood. The, the rise of the Nephilim made the wicked believe that they could overthrow God, er eradicate uh, all knowledge of God, you know, from the face of the earth. So there is this time that is coming, and like I say, the, the wicked are going to create a tribulation in the earth, and, uh, and at, at three and a half years into what we call the tribulation, there's going to be a time that is the wrath of God poured out. And I want you to understand, because we are in Jesus, we are delivered from the wrath of God. We will not go through this. We will not be here when God pours out his wrath on the wicked of the world. That is, that is the first promise that we have about the benefit of being in Christ Jesus. Now, I want, I want you to realize that uh, this is going to be like nothing that has ever, ever happened. And there is nothing that I can see that the Bible teaches us that we can do to uh, uh, bring about the rapture. Uh, the rapture is coming. You know, there are things that, that can happen that will hasten the second coming of Jesus. Now, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus are not the same thing. The rapture is where Jesus comes and, and, and calls away the bride of Christ, and we go to meet him. But the, the second coming of Jesus is when Jesus himself comes to planet Earth the second time, and he will not come as a, as a suffering servant. He will come as a ruling king, and he will overthrow the wicked in the world, and he will establish his kingdom here on Earth, and he will rule and reign here on planet Earth for 1,000 years. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that. Now, the Apostle Paul evidently, and we're going to see this in Scripture, evidently when he would go into these places that never heard the gospel, he would, he would preach the gospel, which was about what happened on the cross, which was what happened in the grave, and which was what happened in the resurrection. And those are the three aspects uh, of, of the cross, what we call the cross, that if you, if you don't know all three of those aspects, and the truth is you don't know uh, uh, about the gospel. You, you might know some part of the gospel, but, but we need to thoroughly know all three of those aspects of what happened, what happened on the cross, what happened in the grave, what happened in the resurrection. And by knowing all of those pieces, we will be prepared for everything that we will ever face. I got the reason there's a spiritually impotent church in the world today is because honestly, I don't meet many believers that know much of anything about what happened on the cross, what happened in the grave, or what happened in the resurrection. 
So, so they, they know some things, they know enough to get born again, but they don't know enough to a walk in a faith that actually protects them and causes them to be able to experience the provision, the protection, and the deliverance of God. And so we're going to go in that. But evidently, based on one of the letters that Paul wrote to one of the churches, we're going to, which we're going to talk about, evidently he taught about the rapture and the second coming of Jesus uh, everywhere that he preached the gospel. And we're going to see this from the scripture. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the kinds of questions that people in that day had. We're going to talk about where can you find this in the Bible? Uh, were there types of this in the Old Testament? Yes, there absolutely were. So we're going to dive into this. I'm going to give you everything that I can give. But I'm calling this the morning after because I just want to tell you, on the day that the rapture occurs, the greatest blessing to people who are looking for his return, looking for his coming, people who love his appearing, on that day, it's going to be the greatest blessing. As a matter of fact, Paul calls it the blessed hope. It's going to be the greatest, most glorious manifestation of God that has ever happened in the world. But I got news for you. The day after that happens is going to be the beginning of the darkest times that have ever been on planet Earth. And uh, thank God we don't have to be here for those times. Thank God we're going to be delivered from those times. But I want to prepare you so that you do not throw away your faith when we begin to face harder times. Where our, people are already all over the world facing some incredibly challenging times. So I want you to be ready for it. We're going to be talking about the morning after. We're going to be talking about what happens at the rapture, why that's going to be so incredible for us. But then we're going to talk about what starts happening the very next day, because the next day is going to be the beginning of a darkness that's going to consume planet Earth like nothing we have ever seen, nothing we've ever heard of. It's going to be, it's going to be worse than what was happening before the flood of Noah. Now, listen, be sure to download this series if you want to dive in and, and you really want to get a, get a deep dive in this. Also, go to my website, impactministries.com. Consider uh, joining up with us to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. I'll talk to you again next week.